Amen. If you got your Bibles, we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 today, uh, and we're going to read 14 uh, through 16 up front, and then we'll read um, 17 through 21 uh, as we continue through the message. But we've been in a sermon series uh, called Simple Gospel. I like to teach in sermon series because it takes a big idea and you can break it out uh, week by week. So this is actually week five, uh, and this is the last week of this sermon series. Uh, Just to catch you up in week one, uh, we talked about leaving the leap. So we started in the garden where God created humanity in perfection. We saw that Adam and Eve gave in to the serpent at that point. Their eyes were open. The Bible says that they were naked and ashamed. So they found what was around them in their environment to cover themselves. That was fig leaves or leaves of some kind. And God came to the garden. He said, Adam and Eve, where are you? Uh, God did not misplace Adam and Eve. But that was for Adam to self-identify where he was. Uh, So when Adam self-identified, God came down. He looked at the scene, and he said, your fig leaves are not sufficient. So the Bible says that he provided with them uh, skins of tunic, uh, which represent the first blood sacrifice in Scripture. Uh, So what God did is he took something that was innocent, and he laid it down, and he covered something that was guilty. Because for God to be in right relationship with them, there had to be justice there. Uh, And then in week week two, we talked about making sense of sacrifice. So we learned specifically about the Passover lamb and how the Passover lamb, every person had to take a lamb and they had to slaughter and put the blood on the doorpost. And then when the death angel would come by, it would pass over their house. That's a shadow or a foretaste of Jesus's redemption uh, through blood in the New Testament. So that gives another shadow. Uh, In week three, we talked about escaping Egypt. So we talked about how um, the nation of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons. They were, uh, they produced a nation with inside of Egypt and they were captives, they were slaves. Um, And then Moses sent a deliverer, or God sent a deliverer, his name was Moses, to deliver those people out of bondage. We said Egypt was a type of the world, Pharaoh was a type of Satan, uh, and they were enslaved and they needed freedom. The same way that the Bible says that we are dead in the trespasses of our sin, the Bible says that we are a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. So it's an Old Testament type or a shadow of God's freeing redemption when we're a slave to sin and how he makes us new in Christ. And then last week we talked about the price of peace and the price that Jesus paid for us to be made right with God. Uh, This week, we're going to focus in on what does that actually look like? Simple gospel, how does that affect me? So if you've got your Bibles today, uh, we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. And this isn't a new thought in Scripture. Um, Isaiah, the prophet, said uh, that at some point that God will do a new thing. Behold, I am doing a new thing. The prophet Isaiah prophesied this. Um, also Ezekiel said this, that, uh, in the last days that God would give us a new heart and a new spirit. The Bible says to another prophet that he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And then Jesus said this, I've come to give new wine. So there's this thought all throughout scripture about new being made new, the old passing away, all things being made new. So second Corinthians chapter five, verses 14 through 21 says this, either way, Christ Love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old lives. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and when he was raised, uh, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating ourselves from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we view him now. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your word. Lord, your word represents seed and our heart represents soil. I ask, Lord, that in this moment, whatever's happened up until this point, whatever we're fixated on, whatever we're focused on, whatever our week has looked like, God, help us lay that aside to focus on you and your word. Uh, Lord, your your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Uh, Your word's also described as a sword. Uh, Your word is able to teach us, to correct us, to reprove us. And Lord, we ask that we would come under the authority of your word today and that you would equip the saints for the working of the ministry. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 Second Corinthians, Paul's, uh, Paul's writing a letter to a church in Corinth. Uh, so Corinth was a region that, that Paul planted a church. 
uh, and he began pastoring this church. So he uh, began uh, conversing with them through letters because Paul was on a missionary journey. So oftentimes he corresponded with people through letters. Uh, and Corinthians, first and second Corinthians, is one of the largest discourses of scripture that we have to one particular group. So this would be to what we would call the church in Corinth. Uh, the word church in the Greek, which is the original uh, writing that we see in our New Testament, that word means ecclesia. And ecclesia means this, a gathering of people. So when Paul was writing this letter, he was writing this letter to a gathering of people, and he was talking to them about different things. He was giving them instruction. He was encouraging them in Christ, all of these different things. And then at this point in the letter, he begins talking to them and reminding them where he says in, an, in another letter about the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel's simple. It's not hard. It's not complex. Oftentimes we make it complex when it's really not. Paul wrote this in another letter. He said this, he said, I fear that somehow the same way that the serpent deceived Eve, that he's also deceived you through his craftiness from the simplicity that is the gospel. And that's where this whole sermon series came about is when Paul said, I'm worried, I'm stressed, I'm, I'm anxious that the same way that the enemy deceived Eve, he's deceiving who he was writing to, but it also is applicable to us today from the simplicity that is in Christ. So Paul writes here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and through verse 14 through 21, he really lays out the gospel simply in a beautiful way. And there's a few things that I want to pull out from that. We're going to go verse by verse. We're going to look at it. We're going to pull it out and see how does this apply to us? What is Paul talking about here? And how does what he's referring to how does he make it the simple gospel? Point number one, convinced. Point number one, convinced. Paul was convinced. Uh, the definition of convinced means this, to move by argument or evidence to belief. That's what the word convinced means. It means to move by argument or evidence to belief. It's an agreement, uh, consent, or a course of action. And Paul starts out his letter saying this, either way, Christ's love controls us. He's convinced by this. He's controlled, other translations say, compelled, or he's captured by this. What is Paul captured by? He's captured by Christ's love. Either way, you know, he says, I'll do this, do that. If you read uh, previous verses in chapter 5, you know, whether we're this, whether that, whatever you think, e either way. When it gets down to brass tacks, either way, it's Christ's love that compels us or that controls us. Verse 14 talks about this idea of a controlling love or a compelling love. Um, and as I was working on uh, this message this week, this thought came to me. For those of you who are note takers, you can jot this down. I thought it was good. Uh, whatever captures your attention controls your affection. Whatever captures your attention, it will control your affection. So question, what's capturing your attention right now in this moment? If you look through your thought life, if you look through your agenda, if you look through your week, what's capturing your attention? That's controlling your affection. And I'll just tell you, the Bible says this in Matthew 6, to seek first the kingdom of God, to seek, to seek first. Christ should be first. So if it's Christ's love that controls Paul, and it now should control us, what does Christ's love look like? Well, it looks like Christ, because it's Christ's love. Well, how do we see, or how has it been shared, Christ's love? Well, we see it through all, throughout Scripture. So I want to share with you a couple things of what Christ's love looks like. First of all, it's sacrificial. Christ's love is, is sacrificial. He said that I've come to serve, not be served. I've come to lay my life down as a ransom for many. All of his disciples were really confused when he showed up and he started washing his disciples' feet. It's a sacrificial kind of love. I would imagine that his disciples were probably really confused when Jesus took a beating for them and climbed on a cross, but, but it's a sacrificial kind of love. And that sacrificial kind of love is what compelled Christ, not only is Christ's love sacrificial, but it's patient. Christ's love is patient. Now, I don't, I don't know what your dad was like. I don't know what your parent or guardian, I don't, I don't know what life looked like when you were being raised. Uh, but some of us, we have parents or we had parents that if this was the line, 
If you're anything like me, you stepped over here, and as soon as that happened, like on you, like I mean right now. So, so oftentimes our filter or our lens in which we view God is close to that because that's our representation. And oftentimes in our relationship when we engage God, it's like we cross this line. It's like the movie, uh, smite me, oh mighty smiter. Like that's what we think. Like that's what we think God is ready for. But what I've learned about, uh, about Christ through scripture is that his love is patient. His, his love is kind. First Corinthians, it, it talks about what does love actually look like. It's patient. Think about Peter. Peter said this, Jesus, I love you so much. I'll never deny you. Everybody else will deny you. They'll give up on you, but not me. No way. Jesus looks at him and says, dude, by the time the rooster crows, you'll do it not once, not twice, but three times. That ends up happening. Peter's embarrassed. Peter's down on himself. He's frustrated. How many of you have ever been there? You told God, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then you did it at times three. <laughs> yeah. And what I love about Jesus is, is, is after that happened, Peter is like, man, I'm just going fishing. Because when you've made a mistake, when you've walked away from Jesus, when you've done what you told him you're not going to do, you oftentimes find yourself frustrated. So you go back to doing what you were doing before. Remember, Jesus was a fisherman. So he said, well, I can't do this Jesus thing, so I'm just going to go back to what I was doing before. And Jesus went back and found Peter doing what he was doing when he originally found him, and he called him back to his purpose. He said, Peter, come on. Peter saw that it was Jesus, and Peter was like, man, what are you doing here? I'm going to... So he jumps out of the boat naked and goes up and has breakfast with Jesus. What does Jesus say to Peter? Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus say, do you love me? Jesus was restoring Peter in that moment for every time that he failed, every time that he uh, fall short. It's because Jesus' love is patient. He was patient with him. He's patient with me and you. Jesus' love is limitless. It doesn't say I can't. It doesn't say I won't. It says don't only go a mile with somebody, but go another mile. Give the shirt off your back. Jesus' love is limitless. It knows no racial boundaries. Jesus' love is limitless. It doesn't know enemies. Jesus says love your enemies and pray for those who, who, who persecute you. There is nothing that's limiting Christ's love. So when Paul says Christ's love controls me, it's that sacrificial, patient, limitless kind of love. And then he goes on and says this, since we believe. Okay, so Christ's love controls Peter. He's, he's convinced of that. And then he goes on uh, in verse, uh, in, in, later on in verse 14, and he says this, since we believe. So whatever, whatever Paul is getting ready to say, whatever he's, he's just about to say, because of this, and then there's an effect. So since we believe, then all the other stuff comes. So let's see, what, what, does, what does Paul say here? Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we are all dead to our old life. Paul is referring here about death to self. Death to self is evidence of you and I believing in Jesus. Our death to self, our denying ourself, us saying that it's no longer my way, us saying that I'm no longer the boss, I'm no longer in charge, but God, your word is in charge. Holy Spirit, you're in charge of my life. I'm going to deny myself. It's not about my wants, my needs, my preferences, my philosophies, my, ras my rationales. It's not about my Jesus it's all about you. Death to self, I like this, um, is that it's done by faith. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe. What does that word believe, like what are some words that come to mind when you hear the word believe? Faith, right? If you believe in something, you have faith for it. So because of this, we believe that we have all died to our old life. If you want to get stronger at dying to your old life, you have to do it by faith. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible says this, that anything done without faith is sin. So we believe that we've died to our old self 
by faith. How many of you realize that when you came in relationship with Christ, Christ didn't come down and just smash all your desires and it's like you never wanted anything that was contrary against scripture again? Just me? Okay, cool. I'm glad we're on the same page here. It happens by believing in faith that I'm going, you know, I want this. I think this is going to satisfy me right now. But God, I believe your word over that relationship. I believe your word over my want. I believe your word over my desire. I believe your word over my anger. I believe your word over my fear, over my anxiety. I'm going to believe your word in, in faith. I'm going to do it in, I'm going to do it in faith. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 6. It's just another portion where Paul is talking about death to self. Since we have been united with him in death, we are also raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful self was crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves of sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we have died to Christ, we know we will also live with him. Pastor, you're talking a lot about sin. The Bible does, so that's kind of my job. Uh, but there's a way to do that, okay? You and I, we've been around or we've heard churches that love to talk about grace, 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 everything's grace. Live how you want and do what's wrong. But you and I have also been to churches that it's like, you are a sinner and you're going to hell. You're going to burn forever. Shame on you. Like we've been there, right? Okay, so the Bible says, let's write a new song. Real grace allows you to walk out hard truth. That's it. It's a balance. It's grace and it's truth. It's truth and it's grace. And without one or the other, truth without grace, you're just rough. Grace without truth, you've got a circus. It's, it's, it's not God's design. It's not his role. It's not his function. He wants us to balance that. Now, there's something in 2 Corinthians that I want to point out to you that I want to show you. It says, since we believe that Christ died for all. So since we believe, what do we believe? We believe that Christ died for all, okay? So that's one camp, okay? We believe that Christ died for all. We also believe that we have all died to our old life, okay? So... We believe that Christ died for the world. There are people that are in here that are in that category. You believe that Christ died for the world. There are also people in here that are in this second category of you believe that Christ died for the world, so now you also die to self. There's people that are in here that are in that category, okay? So this category, that category, there's two categories. This category right here is, is the bunch that we're singing this song. We're going, they're singing that bunch because they believe that Christ died and they've died to self, but they're just, you know, they're, they're sour, they're bitter. Like they came in and they're like, oh my gosh, like, can you believe that pastor's wearing like jeans with holes in it? And I'm like, yeah, but I really adore Jesus. And you know, the Bible says that he doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart and he says, I, I love Jesus. But do you, you sour thing? Like, that's what I want to ask. Like, do you? I just want to, we'll just move on. So there's this idea of, of people who live this life that it's like, oh, I, I believe enough that I'm going to deny myself, period. But watch what Paul says. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also die to self. He died for everyone that those who receive his new life. That's a third category of people. That's the one I'm wanting to push you into. That's the one where Jesus is at. That's the one where the simple gospel is at. You believe that he died for the world. You believe it, so you die to yourself, but you receive his new life, and it's a life-giving gospel. It's life-giving. It's not draining. It's, like, it's life-giving. If you believe, if you believe, then you receive. Like, it's not prosperity gospel. 
It's just literally Christ died for us. We receive his life. We believe in Christ's death for us. We believe that uh, we have all died to self. Um, so we receive this new life. Christ died. We died to self. We receive his life into our emptiness, into our emptiness. I jotted this down for this, for this thought as well. Death to self without Jesus' empowerment is just religion. Death to self without Jesus' empowerment, this new life that Jesus has for us is simply religion. It's rule keeping. It's yes, no, it's check mark, it's check mark religion. Do this, do that. It's going back to what Paul's trying to tell everybody, get out of. It's, it's going back to that law mentality. It's going back to that idea. Paul was convinced. He was convinced by Christ's love. He was convinced that we had to die to self. So point number one, convinced, and then just a fact for that, I am convinced to live for Jesus, I must die to self. To live for Jesus, I must die for self. Verse 17 says this, this means, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, this means that anyone, I'm in that category, I'm one of the whosoevers. Like I'm the one who doesn't deserve the gospel but receive the gospel, was transformed by the gospel. Dead and alive. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. Point number one, Paul was convinced. Point number two, converted. This is for me and you. Converted. To convert something means to change or transfer, uh, to transform uh, form from one established thing to another. So to change or transform from one established thing to another. So I want, I want you to ca- catch up with what Paul's saying. Believe that Christ died for the world. Believe death to self. Receive, okay, so believe, believe, receive. And now there's this new idea of belong to Jesus. This is why I love scripture because it's just principle. Like if you just look for the, for the big words, it's just like, okay, so step one, two, three, and four. It's just right here. You just gotta, it's simple. You just gotta open up. So believe, okay, they died for the world. Believe died to self. Receive this new life. Okay, now I belong to Christ, which means it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Romans 12. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing power of God's word and present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That means I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. If if you've been bought by the power of the gospel, if you receive Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you're not your own. You're not the boss. You know how easy it is to live my life with me not being a boss? Because I'm silly. I would have said another word there, but I'm just, you know, at church. I'm not smart, but Christ is. He's good, and he controls my life. I want to make bad decisions. I want to. I'm a pastor, and I want to make bad decisions. Don't look at me that way. So do you. Like, you want to do those things, but that's where believing in faith, I'm denying myself because I know God's word is, I know it's true. And I've been converted. I belong to Christ. Believing, receiving, now belonging. The fruit of belonging to Christ is you're a new person. That's the fruit. That's the, that's the evidence of belonging to Christ is that you're a new person. There's a clear distinction between the old and the new. I love going to the mall with Val and Amos. Because I go to the mall and I see people from when I was in middle school, high school, a couple years after high school. And, you know, most of us were probably, you know, friends on Facebook or whatever. And they see what I'm doing now. I haven't always been a pastor. Like I was kind of like, if this is pastor, I was probably like the opposite of that. So when I see these people at the mall, they'll come up to Val and me and they'll be like, dude, what happened to you? (laughs) You're like a, you're like a new person or something. Like, actually, that's a great introduction to a conversation that I'd love to have with you. Has anybody ever told you about Jesus? Like, you know, like it's just a great Introduction, because there's a clear distinction from old to new. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ. It's Christ who lives in me. Like Jesus doesn't want much from you; He just wants your entire life. That's it. Like if you want this gospel message to really be simple and work, say, "Okay, I'm not holding anything back. 
Jesus, you can have it all. My schedule, my kids, my relationship, my mouth. You can have it all. Don't talk to me about the gospel not being powerful in your life if Jesus doesn't hold the key. Because the one who holds the key runs the car. If the car ain't running where you want it, check who's driving. All right. All of this, death to self, death to the old life, receiving this new life is available through Jesus' resurrection. I jotted this uh, line down because oft- oftentimes it's hard for us to really relinquish everything to Jesus. It's because we, we have a misinformed view of who Jesus is. We think boss, hammer, singing this song. Jesus is loving and he knows what's best for you. So I jotted this down. The lens in which you view God determines the relationship in which you have with him. The lens in which you view God determines the relationship that you have with him. If you view him as, that's what you'll receive. But if you view him as Christ came to share him, a loving father, a loving sacrificial, patient, limitless father, it looks, it looks a little bit different. Me and you, we need to be converted. I jotted this down too. I am converted. I'm not modified, but I'm made new. Notice I'm not modified. It's not behavior change. It's not, oh, I had a little Jesus in my life. See what that does. Like if Jesus is the center of your life, imagine it like a, like a, like a, a wheel. All those spokes are connected to what? The center, the center hub, all of those. But oftentimes what we do in our relationship with Jesus is we pie him. We give him a slice of pie. We give him a slice of our day. We give him a slice of our family. We give him a slice of our devotion. We give him a slice of our finances. You know, it's easier to give to God when you realize that you don't own anything at all. It's all his. You're just stewarding it. A slice of your mouth. You know, hey, I'll watch my mouth when I'm in church. But other than that, you know. It's because we give him slice. I call it slice life Christianity. You can jot that down. That's a fun one. All right, verse 18 through 21. And all of this, what, what's all of this? It's all the stuff that we've read, all the stuff that we've talked about previously. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Prior to Christ, the Bible says this, that you were alienated from God which means that you literally could not get farther away from him if you possibly tried. That's where, we, that, that's where we all start in our relationship with him, is alienated in sin, away from God, and Jesus like a bridge over a gap that you could never get over makes us able to get back into relationship with God brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this this task of reconciling people to him. So he brought us back to himself, and then he's given us this new task now of reconciling people to himself. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, That's pretty cool. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors, God making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for our sin so that we might be right with God through Christ. If I just read verses 18, 18 through 21, that's the gospel. Like, that's, that's worth you coming today. It's just, just reading the principle that you were alienated, that you were far away from God, and that God, through Christ, reconciled or made a, mean, made a means in which you could be made right with him through faith by you believing in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You dying to self you repenting from sins and turning away from them and turning to God. That's our role as Christ followers is to live in this body now, alienated from God, 
receiving what Jesus has done in faith so that we could be made right with God. Point number three, charged. Charged. This was Paul's life, and now it's something that he gives to us. What are we charged with? We're charged with purpose. We're charged with mission. We're charged with calling. Remember, Christ paid for you so you don't own yourself, which means that he gets to will and to work his, you in his good pleasure. Everything that you have, your gifts, your talents, all of that, it belongs to God. Our role as Christ followers, it's just simply to give him his gift back so that he can reach more people through us. You're a vessel. And, and vessels have one job, to get filled up and to pour out. To get filled up and to, to pour out. How many of you remember uh, the widow in 2 Kings that Elijah went up to and she said, I don't, I, ain't, I don't have nothing to give you. And Elijah's like, yeah, yeah, you do. G- 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 give me what you got. And she's like, well, I got this and I got that. And the Bible says that the oil just kept coming. Why? Because she was willing to pour. The little bit that she had, she was willing to pour that out. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, I only have a little bit. Can I just tell you, in faith, just pour that out. Because God's faithful to refill that. Will you do me a favor and just stand with me today? Point number three, charged. He's charged us with purpose, with mission, and with calling. It's a gift from God. The gift from God is us being able to be in right relationship with him or brought back to him through Christ. But it doesn't stop there. God uh, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a, is a big word. So here, here's, what, what, here's an example of, of reconcile. So imagine you're at a stoplight, and I know that you're not on your phone, so we'll put it on the, perp- on the person behind you. Someone was on their phone behind you, you're stopped at a light, they come up, they hit you in the rear end. You get out, and I know you're nice to them, and said, oh, bless your heart. Did you miss my car there? I'm so sorry, are you okay? I know that's how you would respond. I didn't do that the other day when somebody hit me. Um, so they hit you, and then w- what do you do? Can I get your license and your insurance? Because you're reaching out to their insurance to fix your car that's been damaged, that's been hurt. So the insurance company is making things right on behalf of that person. That person hit you, they call their insurance company and they're like, hey, whoops, I did this. Can you fix this for me? The good thing about our insurance agent is he's not going to jack up that price after that happens. But he's going to he's going to fix that. He, he's going to fix that, and make that make that right. Recon, uh, this message of reconciliation. We are Christ's ambassadors. What's an ambassador? It's someone that represents another nation. Well, why would Paul call us his ambassadors? It's because we we represent a kingdom, a kingdom with a king. And when you think about a kingdom, there's a kingdom that has a domain, it has subjects, there's territories, and and we are, can I just tell you, you're not king of the kingdom. There's one king and his name is Jesus. You, sir or ma'am, you are a subject. That's us, that's our role. But we're also his ambassadors, which means that we get to share the message of the kingdom to those who are around us. We're ambassadors for for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. So when I look at your life, like if you've got the tattoo, if you've got the verse on the Instagram bio, if you've got the Jesus bumper sticker, if you've got the hashtag whatever, like if you say, you know, if you're at work and they ask you, you know, something about, oh, I go to church. Like if that's you, that means that you are now representing the kingdom as an ambassador. And now Like whether you say it with your words, your life is an appeal. People are looking at you to see what Jesus is like. 
sometimes you are the only word that people will ever see or read. So I just want to ask you nicely, because I've had to ask myself this all week, so I just figured I'd share the love. Is your life appealing or appalling when it comes to your relationship with Christ and what you show others? Is your life appealing? Like when people look at you, are they like, man, I'm like, do people look at you like, there's that religious person? Like, like what, what, do they, what do they think or when they see you? Are they like, man, that's, they're so, they just got so much joy, so much love. Like they're so sacrificial. They're so patient. Their love is limitless. You know, it, it kind of looks like Christ, but I think my favorite thing when we're talking about being charged, what, what are we charged with? I love this, that it says this. We, can, uh, we speak for Christ when we plead. That word plead means earnestly beg. When we earnestly beg, when we plead, come back to God. Come back to God. And maybe you're here and you're thinking, well, Pastor, I've been talking about sin. Here he goes. He's going to get him. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, well, yeah, come back to God. That's a good message for those who are just walked in straight away from God. Somebody needs to hear that message today, Pastor. <laughs> like somebody's thinking that right now. Can I just tell you that message is for every person in this room? If you're far away from God, or if you feel like you're religious or whatever, you think that you are, can I just challenge you to come back to God today? Like, not your religion, not your rules, not your philosophy, your ideology, your thought of how it should handle. Like some people like, and, and trust me, like this is my job, I love theology. Some people get so wrapped up in that that they miss Jesus. I just tell you, Jesus is perfect theology. His love is perfect theology. His passion is perfect theology. And he's been screaming this message in the hearts of humanity. Come back to God with every head bowed and every eye shut. Just want you to imagine for a moment all the things that you've got going on in life. All your ups, all your downs, all your anxiousness, all your fear, all your worry. I just want you to hear the message that Paul gives to us to give to others. Come back to God. Are you hurting today? I know a father. Come back to God. Are you frustrated today? Come back to God. Are you dead in the trespass of your sin? Come back to God. Are you hurting? Are you anxious? Are you worried about something? What are you trying to control today that God's saying, put in my hands? You know, the more you try to control something, the less you tell God that he has a right to work in it and through it. Quit trying to control it. Quit trying to handle it. Just come back to God today. Wherever you are, however far you've been, just come back to him today. Paul charged us with this with this, this work, this gift of, of helping reconcile people. So I want to ask you a question. You can look up at me for just a second. So he charged us with this, this role of reconciling, uh, this, this gift that we have now to tell people to come back to God. I just want to ask you, um, you know, all of us together, we make up the church. Like none of us individually, like Chaz is not the church. My wife, Val, she's not in the church. Our elders are not in the church. We, together, united, broken, young, old, we are the church. What does our message to, G, to, to Xenia look like collectively? It looks like our individual lives. Our individual lives collectively represent our church's message to the city of Xenia. So what I wanna ask you today is home church, is it, is it, like, I don't care about the outside. I think the outside's cute. <laughs> My wife had a big hand in that. 
But that's just a piece, dude. Like that is just a piece. I love the floors in our lobby. I love the lights. Like that's cool. Like it, it all works great. I love the sound. Like listen to Lincoln play, man, that's so good. But it's not good if it's not for Jesus. If it's not saying come back to God. Like these are all just tools and things. For, like the message is Jesus. The hope is Jesus. So I wanna ask you like when Xenia hears or sees home church, do they think, oh yeah, that one church or do they think, man, that, those people are passionate about Jesus. Those people are sacrificial. Those people are patient. Those people, they're limitless. They will pursue people. They're like hound dogs looking for people who are lost and away from Jesus because God has given us this ministry now to reconcile the world to himself. When's the last time someone lost broke your heart? When's the last time just the spiritual temperature of the people who are around you burdened you? The gospel's simple, it's not confusing. It's really easy to share. Hey, I was dead in the trespass of my sin, but I believed in Jesus and now I'm made alive. I'm not perfect, but I'm being perfected. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Just one question, we end with it every week. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? For all of us, what does it look like today for you to come back to God? Come back to God in what area? that your prayer this morning. not gone too far. Jesus, thank you for this day. In Jesus' name.